Today we're going to cover some of the events that occurred during Gamete Genesis. I'll review the important steps and show some examples of what can happen when those steps fail to occur normally. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the Histology Wizard. Take a look at the big events in the human life cycle, which I've roughly outlined in this cartoon. Development of the embryo begins at fertilization, the process by which the male gamete sperm and the female gamete the oocyte unite to give rise to the zygote. But I'm going to talk today about the origin of specialized cells called primordial germ cells. These are the cells that give rise to the sex cells or the gametes to spermatozoa and oocytes that both have the ability to transmit genetic and epigenetic information, abilities they acquire during embryogenesis even though they won't function to form the next generation for several decades, after the onset of puberty. Amazingly, though, one of the very first things that happens in the developing embryo is that the germline, or the gametes, are set aside for the next generation. Based on animal models, we think this occurs just prior to gastrulation, which is the beginning of the third week in development. So let's dive in. Here's a cartoon showing a roughly four-week-old embryo and it's been sectioned sagittally so that you can see inside. You're looking at the embryo essentially sitting on top of the yolk sac, and the yolk sac is situated on the ventral aspect of the embryo, and it's the first element seen within the gestational sac during pregnancy, usually as early as three days of gestation. At the cranial or rostral or head end of the embryo, you can see in yellow the foregut, and at the caudal end, the hindgut. And you can see that these are both contiguous with the yolk sac at this early stage. You can also see the heart in its proper location as a result of head folding after gastrulation. Now the primordial germ cells that I've colored here in green form at the end of week two, probably from the posterior epiblast, and then they migrate in through the primitive streak during gastrulation, and they sort of just wander into the yolk sac at around week three. They're not recognizable until week four, but by then you can recognize them by their distinct morphology and by molecular markers. So now let's look at a different embryo and make that yolk sac a little smaller. And in this cartoon, you can still see those primordial germ cells in green in the yolk sac. This is a little bit later in development, so you can really see that the digestive tube is developing. I want you also to note this structure in blue. This is the genital or gonadal ridge, which arises from intermediate mesoderm near the primitive kidney, which is shown there in pink. Now that whole area is sometimes called the genital urinary ridge. And this is where the germ cells are going to end up. So here's that cartoon again. Now those primordial germ cells are going to migrate through the primitive streak during gastrulation into the yolk sac. In fact, primordial germ cells are probably the earliest cells to migrate into the embryo during gastrulation. So they migrate in, and then they'll move along the yolk sac wall, migrate to the posterior endoderm that forms the hindgut, and from there they'll migrate into the genital ridge. They migrate by amoeboid movement, they do this between four and six weeks of development, and they continue to divide by mitosis as they migrate. So here's a movie, this is actually a mouse embryo, and it shows the primordial germ cells labeled with green fluorescent protein actually migrating. These cells will come to rest in the sixth week on either side of the midline in that gonadal ridge, where they'll continue to divide and to influence the formation of the gonads. Now what happens if these cells fail to reach these ridges? Well first, this can result in an absent or what we call indifferent gonad, but some can also remain behind in extragonadal sites where they're going to keep dividing. Now what happens if those primordial germ cells become mutated or won't stop dividing? Well we know that occasionally germ cells can give rise to tumors, and these tumors are called teratomas, which literally means monster tumor. Teratomas are tumors composed of tissue of all three germ layers. So they're pluripotent, this means they can make a lot of different tissues. They contain hair, bone, cartilage, nervous tissue, glands, and even teeth. They can occur in the gonads or extragonadally. So one example is this sacrococcygeal teratoma. This tumor is a midline tumor and is the most common tumor in neonates. In fact, these types of tumors account for 3% of all childhood malignancies. Gonadal tumors, on the other hand, or gonadal teratomas, are usually diagnosed after puberty. This one seen here contains teeth and hair, while this H&E stained section of a teratoma shows tissues derived from the three germ layers, 
from endoderm, that's the gastric epithelium and the thyroid, mesoderm, cartilage and adipose tissue, and there's also glandular tissue and primitive nervous tissue that arises from ectoderm. Now, once those primordial germ cells are in the gonadal ridge, as I said, they'll have an inductive influence on the differentiation of the gonad, either into an ovary or a testis, and I'll describe that process in a later embryology video. But today I really want to talk about how these cells differentiate into the gamete precursor cells called spermatogonia in the male and oogonia in the female. Now these cells, like normal somatic cells, are diploid, so they contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 46 total, which is called spermatogenesis and oogenesis, to produce the gametes. And those will undergo meiosis. The gametes then will be haploid and contain 23 chromosomes. Today I'm going to focus on the big picture outlining what happens to the primordial germ cells in spermatogenesis and oogenesis and where and when the processes of mitosis and meiosis occur during each process. I'm also going to talk about the timing of gametogenesis since that differs between the two sexes. I talk more about specific steps, the hormonal and genetic control and the histology of these cells in my reproductive histology videos. So I'll go ahead and start with spermatogenesis. In the male, spermatogenesis takes place in the seminiferous tubules of the testes, and it doesn't occur until puberty. Let's take a cross-section of a tubule and look at the process. So here you can see the spatial arrangement of the developing spermatozoa, from the most primitive to the most mature cells near the lumen. The primordial germ cells, sometimes called gonocytes, remain dormant from about week six of development until puberty. At puberty, there's a huge increase in testosterone, the tubules will differentiate, and the diploid primordial germ cells will start dividing by mitosis, and some of them will differentiate into spermatogony. And these are located immediately under the basement membrane surrounding the tubules, as you can see in the cartoon. The cells that will undergo spermatogenesis, called primary spermatocytes, will arise from these spermatogonia, replicate their DNA, and undergo meiosis I to produce secondary spermatocytes. These are haploid. These immediately go through meiosis II to produce four spermatids, and these spermatids will develop as a syncytia, that is, they'll remain connected via a cytoplasmic bridge. So again, at this point, these are haploid cells with 23 chromosomes. Next, the spermatids will undergo a very dramatic change in morphology that will convert them into spermatozoa as they migrate to the lumen. This process is called spermiogenesis and it takes place with no further divisions. Now, as you might expect, in a process this complicated, errors in differentiation are common, but as long as 50% of the spermatozoa in an ejaculate have normal morphology, fertility will not likely be impaired. We know that each cycle from primordial germ cell to spermatozoa takes about 64 days, and that successive waves of spermatogonia undergo these processes and mature into spermatozoa and this happens pretty continuously in males from puberty to death. Now that's a lot of steps to remember, so I want to go through it again, but this time I want to focus a bit more on when meiosis is occurring, so kind of thinking about what's going on at the chromosomal level. Before puberty, we have our dormant primordial germ cells, and these are diploid. At puberty, some of them will undergo mitosis to become spermatogonia, They'll replicate their DNA and go through meiosis I where the homologous chromosomes will separate and become secondary spermatids. Those will undergo meiosis II. This is where the sister chromatids will separate and the cells will become haploid spermatids with one single-stranded chromosome or chromatid of each type. This is the end of spermatogenesis. Now each step has different timing. Meiosis I, which is that reduction division, diploid to haploid, will take days, while meiosis II, the equatorial division, or separation of the sister chromatids, will happen in hours. And so it's actually very hard to even see a secondary spermatocyte in an H&E stain section of the seminiferous tubules. Now at this point, spermiogenesis events will begin as the spermatids differentiate into more mature spermatozoa, but full maturation of sperm will occur after the spermatozoa exit the seminiferous tubules. 
All right, so that's how sperm are generated in the male. Now the timing of oogenesis is quite different. In females, once arriving at the gonadal ridge, the primordial germ cells will undergo a few more mitotic divisions, and they will then differentiate into oogonia. And those oogonia will divide and generate primary oocytes. Each primary oocyte becomes covered by a layer of epithelial follicle cells, and this whole unit will constitute a primary follicle. Now, by about five months of development, all oogonia have become primary oocytes. So this is about 7 million primordial follicles that will all begin meiosis. And during an early phase of meiosis I, all the primary oocytes will enter a dormant state, so they remain arrested as primary oocytes until sexual maturity. And the nucleus at this point is called a germinal vesicle. Now, some of these follicles will remain in meiotic arrest, but most will actually degenerate by a process called atresia. So this is a big difference. During spermatogenesis, spermatozoa are generated continuously, but females generate all their potential gametes before birth. Now, after reaching puberty, monthly cycles in the hypothalamic, pituitary, and ovarian hormones control a menstrual cycle, which results each month in the production of a female gamete and a uterus primed to receive a fertilized embryo. And each cycle, the follicular epithelium of a small group of primordial follicles will thicken, converting them to primary follicles. And one of these will gain primacy and begin to mature and develop and under hormonal control, will actually resume and complete meiosis I, enter meiosis II. And right before ovulation, the oocyte will arrest at metaphase of meiosis II. And it stays this way even after ovulation. It only completes when it becomes fertilized. So specifically when the sperm cell membrane fuses with the oocyte cell membrane. Now you can check out my video on fertilization to see what happens next. And for more details on the ovarian cycle and the follicular development, you can check out my video on the ovaries and ovarian cycle. All right, let's review the timing of oogenesis. So those diploid primordial germ cells will arrive at the genital ridge and differentiate into oogonia. They're gonna replicate their DNA, enter meiosis I, and arrest as primary oocytes. Importantly, this all happens in the first five months of development. Now, starting at puberty, a set of follicles will resume development, and usually one will mature into a secondary oocyte that will complete meiosis I and arrest in meiosis II, and eventually ovulate. Now, upon fertilization, it will complete meiosis II, so it's a haploid gamete that's completed meiosis II. Now, these cycles begin at puberty and they continue until the onset of menopause, which is at roughly 50 years of age. Now, why is the timing different here? And what makes a primordial germ cell differentiate as either a spermatogonia or an oogonia? Well, it's interesting, and research suggests that all of these cells, regardless of genotype, are programmed to develop first as oocytes, but that there are actually inhibitors in the male genital ridge that inhibit meiosis, while other factors actually drive meiosis in females. Now, speaking of females, I want to mention an important point about the oocyte. So it turns out that not only is the oocyte genome critical, but the oocyte cytoplasm is also required for this maternal to embryonic transition. We know that maternal factors, or what we call cytoplasmic determinants, which I've just drawn in here as orange circles and green triangles, we know these are differentially distributed in the oocyte, which you can also see in my cartoon. Now, after fertilization, Mitotic divisions will cause these determinants to be unequally distributed in the daughter cells. Now, why is this even important? Well, we know that various aspects of embryonic development, including maternal mRNA degradation, epigenetic reprogramming, signal transduction, and even initiation of the embryonic genome activation, they all depend upon these maternal factors. And so, and so perturbations of maternal factors can actually result in decreased oocyte quality, and this can affect fertility. Now, many different things can affect the distribution of these factors, including maternal diabetes and aging.
All right, let's summarize gametogenesis. So first, gametogenesis ensures that the chromosome number is reduced to half. Second, it allows for recombination of genetic information that generates variability. It allows for morphological differentiation of the gametes and begins to prepare them for fertilization. And finally, during this process, maternal factors are differentially localized in the oocyte. Unfortunately, we know that many health and developmental problems in humans can be traced back to changes in the structure and number of copies of chromosomes. And around 50% of spontaneous abortions are due to chromosomal abnormalities, and many of these abnormalities arise in the germline because of errors in meiosis. So gametes that arise from these errors will contain missing or extra chromosomes with duplicated, deleted, or rearranged segments. Aneuploidy which is the presence of an abnormal number of chromosomes in a cell, can arise from what we call non-disjunction during meiosis. Well, how exactly does this happen? Well, remember that human cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 autosomes, and two sex chromosomes. Only reproductive cells undergo meiosis. Now, normally, a diploid cell will give rise to four haploid gametes with a single set of chromosomes. Non-disjunction happens when chromosomes fail to separate normally during either meiosis I or meiosis II. So if we start with this diploid cell, normally the chromosome pairs are going to separate in meiosis I. However, in non-disjunction, this fails to happen. The result is gametes that have abnormal numbers of chromosomes. Now, upon fertilization with a normal gamete, the results will be either trisomy, where the haploid gamete will fuse with a gamete that has two copies of chromosomes, or monosomy, where the normal gamete fuses with a gamete that's lacking a chromosome. Now, alternatively, meiosis I could occur normally, but instead of the sister chromatids segregating normally in meiosis II, non-disjunction results in two disomic embryos, one trisomic embryo, and one monosomic embryo. So let's take a look at an example of non-disjunction where the homologous chromosomes fail to separate, resulting in monosomy. So in this case, that normal haploid gamete is paired with a gamete that's missing a chromosome. Now we know that autosomal monosomy is fatal, and this is probably due to gene dosage. But monosomy of the X chromosome results in Turner syndrome, in which a female is partially or completely missing an X chromosome. And this results in some very specific phenotypes. Among other things, these persons have a short and webbed neck, low set ears, they have abnormalities in their um, heart and kidneys, they're very short, and they often require hormone treatment to develop secondary sex characteristics. So that's monosomy. What about trisomy? Remember, in this case, the normal haploid gamete will fuse with a gamete that has two copies of a chromosome instead of one, and the disorder most commonly caused by this error in meiosis is Down syndrome. So around 95% of the time, Down syndrome is a result of non-disjunction of chromosome 21. Down syndrome varies in severity among individuals. It can cause lifelong intellectual disability and developmental delays and other medical problems. It's actually the most common genetic chromosomal disorder and cause of learning disabilities in children. Now, there are other trisomies, but they're often aborted very early. But some, such as Edwards syndrome or Patau syndrome, produce recognizable phenotypes. These are present much less frequently in live births, and they can have more severe effects. In fact, they're almost always fatal. The most common trisomy of the sex chromosomes is Klinefelter syndrome that results from an extra copy of the X chromosome, most commonly due to non-disjunction. Klinefelter syndrome is a genetic condition affecting males, and it isn't often diagnosed until adulthood. So that's it for gametogenesis, the formation of sperm and oocyte. Fertilization is up next, where I'll cover the union of the oocyte and the sperm to form the zygote, and talk about the events of the first two weeks of embryogenesis. Be sure to check out my videos on fertilization and gastrulation. Thanks for stopping by.